Do you see it, please? Do you see it, please? Mr. Dempster? Rob. Um, good. Yeah, he's coming later. Okay, good morning, members, and welcome to the First Communities Committee of 2020. Um, just as a, an advisory, um, I intend to take an additional urgent, urgent item uh, business at item 18, and that is uh, some urgent works needed on the C1W road in Glenluce. Uh, a report will be handed out later in the, in, uh, in the day, and we can uh, give some time to look at its contents. Okay, so moving on, uh, Claire, could we have the cedar? Apologies, please. Thank you, Chair. I've got two apologies this morning from Councillor Fairbairn and Councillor Wood. Um, there's a few members not present, and Councillor Juste, Councillor James, Councillor Wilson. I know Councillor Davidson's coming along later, and Councillor Ingalls is in the building. Apologies for Councillor Wilson. Ian? I was waiting for declarations of interest. I was just getting my mic into position. Sorry, declarations of interest. Ian? Yeah, it's item 17, the land at Mill Island, Obiti. I was involved at the very early stages of in inquiring on behalf of one of my constituents about this land, and that's been over a period of a few years. I think it would be wise in this case if I do not take part in the discussion, but with your uh, agreement, I'll remain in because by the time I get out and back in, it'll be over. And I can watch it on TV anyway. I'm, I'm happy for you to stay. <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of looking at governance because, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, that's happy, happy for you just to stay with you. Thanks for letting us know, Ian. Anyone else? No. Um, move on to item three, the minute of the meeting, the 10th of December. This is for approval. Happy to move. And I'm happy to second. Okay, we agreed. Thank you very much. We'll move on to item four, which is the licensing of sexual entertainment venues, report by community planning and engagement manager. The report is to seek the committee's agreement to carry out a consultation exercise on the licensing of sexual entertainment venues in the Friesen Galloway. The Scottish Government issued guidance on the 28th of March 2019 to assist local authorities with regard to the possible introduction of this new licensing regime, and the Council is legally obliged to have regard to this guidance. Um, I've got Liz uh, here to take um, any questions. Uh, Liz, is there anything that needs to be added to this, or are you happy just to go to questions? Okay, we're ready just to go to questions. Uh, Ian? Thank you. The, on page 31, it shows a, a mandate, a consultation mandate. The report very carefully explains the reasons behind it, that if we don't adopt a policy, that we can't control it. <coughs> This Monday, will, that, is this the, will this be going to the public for consultation and will it be expanded to show the reasons behind the, the thoughts of introducing such a policy? Yes, the mandate is simply um, the mechanism to show you how we're planning to do the consultation. But yes, the consultation will explain to people about what exactly is being covered and um, there will be a, a notice which goes out, which sets out the detail um, and the background to why we would want to be doing that. Um, okay, thanks. Uh, sorry, I was remiss, uh, Caroline, I forgot to introduce you as well. To, so you'll know some of the members won't know you, maybe haven't met you yet. So, uh, Caroline Trainer. Um, just for clarity, for, for me, uh, uh, this is a consultation that worked way down. If we don't get involved in this, then we can't regulate. If, if somebody was to start up, yeah, is that... In, in simple terms, yeah. Okay, so that's a yes. Um, any other questions? John? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Caroline, is the working group a national working group? Is it? Uh, 
Yes, it, it exists as a subgroup of SOLAR and um, it doesn't comprise of all the solicitors and all the local authority areas in Scotland, um, but it is certainly a, um, a national working group. And I, it's met three times. I've met um, that group three times and we're meeting again in March. Anyone else, sorry? No, in that case, then I'll move on to recommendations. Um, one was to note the background to the requirement to consult set out in the, in the paragraphs 3.1 to 3.6. Happy note. Two is approve the carrying out of a consultation exercise with a view to obtaining citizens and partners' views on whether SEVs should be licensed in the Priest and Galloway. We approve that. Thank you. 2.3 note that a report will come to this committee on the 2nd of July 2020 to consider the results of the consultation and decide whether to pass a resolution requiring SEVs to hold a licence and agree an effective date for that resolution. Note. And then 2.4, note that if a decision is made to licence SEVs, there will be further steps in the process and they are detailed in paragraphs 310 to 312. Happy with that? Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Liz and Caroline. Okay, I'll move on to item number five. The Public Convenience Services Review, this is a report by Head and Neighbourhood Services, and it's actually Karen, it's there to uh, answer questions. Uh, the report presents members with an update on the Public Convenience Service Review, which is helping to shape the future provision of public toilets across the Freeson Galloway. The options before members today recognise the need for a change and the value that is placed in these facilities by the public. Um, Karen's here to answer any questions. That Karen, have you anything you want to add? Or are you just happy to go to questions? Nothing further to add, Chair. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, Tracy and then Jim. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, I'm not sure it's actually for this committee. I've got one or two questions regarding opening times of some conveniences. So should I perhaps maybe take it up with Karen, out with the committee? Um, absolutely, because uh, I would ask that you do, and every member does that because the individual issues will be ongoing. Um, what we're, the paper today is about the cleaning regime, which brings immediate savings. Um, we want to agree, so I'd be obliged if you would actually direct any uh, questions about individual toilets to Carn, and that can be covered in the next report, the next update report. So, I mean, basically the, the report today is to is, to, uh, is for us to either agree or not agree the new cleaning regime, which will bring about the huge, uh, uh, relatively huge savings in this uh, service area. Um, uh, Jim. Thanks, Chair. I know you, you keep asking me what you mentioned, Sankar, but I didn't think that would, I didn't think that would extend to Derek and his staff, and I'm only being facetious. Sankar and Kirkcoyne have been missed out of the regime for cleaning on 316, I presume that's just a typographical error. And the other thing is in the appendix, and I don't know how comprehensive it's meant to be, but if you look at, and I only know from my own personal knowledge, if you look at Kirkconnell, it talks about having a library, it's also got the resource base, adult resource centre and health view leisure centre where there'll be a, a, an accessible play park constructed. And in Sankar there's a there's fun there's the fun pool, sorry. So there are a number of facilities of council and properties no featured in this, this report, but there may be a reason for that. And I'm just wondering how comprehensive this appendix is intended to be. Um, I'll, I'll let Karen answer that, but my understanding is it's still a work in progress, and that's the next stage. Um, this is about cleaning regimes just now, rather than alternative provision. And again, I'll just reiterate what we said, is if you've got issues of individual toilets, talk to Karen. Um, and that will get incorporated into... No, um, no, Chair, before Karen answers, I know that I just would want this included in the report because okay, it's well, a decision made by Karen, this committee. Let Karen answer that. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, just your second point there, I can confirm that, that we do have um, all information of other council facilities. Um, it's not all within this report, as, as the appendix is, is rather large at, at this, this current time, so we're aware of the other facilities as well. Um, to go back to your first point for Sankar and Kirkconnell, um, not part of um, the anticipated mobile cleaning regime. Um, it's anti anticipated that they would remain as they are at this current time. Thanks for that, Karen. David? 
Thank you, Chair, and uh, good morning. Uh, the other night I was at a um, community council, a good community council, that's just been re-elected, and it was thinking of uh, dis disbanding itself because it couldn't see the point in working with the council anymore. And I, I raised this idea that I've raised um, several times within the so-called transformation that we, the council would proactively um, invite community councils or other groups to take over services that we um, currently offer and the type of services that we're continually cutting or in some cases completely removing. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to ask the uh, director whether our accounting system allows for speedy, ready reckoning of uh, the cost of particular services should a group approach him on, on this or another service would be re ready to respond, yep, saying it's costing us um, this amount per year, and um, perhaps then the council will be in a position to deal and say, well, for half of that, please take it off our hands. Um, thank you. Derek. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor James. Yes, indeed, the council is committed to working in that way, and indeed the report uh, gives recognition to a community in Port Patrick who have uh, done exactly that. So, therefore, we're quite clear it's a, a, a way we wish to work. However, we need to be clear we don't impose uh, these arrangements on a uh, do it or we close it uh, culture. That's clearly not the culture of this council, and this report reflects that. However, we would be ready. Uh, and are on standby at all times uh, on an active basis to engage communities in that very way of working. And I'd like to see that progress, not just with communities, but with businesses as well. So certainly welcome the point and reassure you that we would be in a place to respond and let's hope we can build on the, the existing arrangements we have uh, on a very small basis to see that grow in the years ahead. Thank you. OK, David. Yep. Anyone else? Hey, Willie? Yeah, Chair, as we're talking about, you know, read configuring the service and looking at it different ways. One of the points that was made to me only last week uh, when I was uh, in one of the shops in Stranra was that there's no public toilets about. And when I pointed out there were at least two, if not three, close to hand, the issue there was that we're not signposting people that these are public uh, conveniences. I refer to uh, buildings like the library, uh, the museum, where there are public toilets in there for the use of the public. I think we need to be signposting better uh, so that people know that there are public toilets and they can use them. Well, I think that's a, a, a really good point and uh, I, I don't think it will fall under Karen's portfolio, but it's in the same service, but we can incorporate that as a suggestion and as we take the rest forward because there's, only, there's to be update reports coming uh, this is about the cleaning regime, know about the signpost and everything else, but take your point, it's a very good point, is that people can use the toilets if they, if they can't find them. Um, so, Karen can ask you to work with, um, through the director, yep. uh, with the relevant uh, people to get some, some signage up of some description. Um, will, it be in live? will it be in Gaelic as well? <clears throat> um, right, okay, we'll leave that for later. Um, <laughs> Uh, anyone else? Any other questions? So, well, are you happy with that? Yeah, because that's where we take it forward. Thank you. Uh, Pauline? Thank you, Chair. I, I think, Karen, it's a great report. Thanks. It's going to save £70,000 uh, odd pounds, then it's sensible. Can I just have confirmation, Karen, about one thing? Uh, in one area, we had one female toilet shut over the course of a weekend. I didn't know if it was for cleaning purposes or if that's going to be part and parcel, and if it is, if they're being upgraded or something was wrong with them, if we could just make sure there was a sign up because we, as women, we queued up and used the men's, which was fine because I've got a loud voice, but um, <laughs> I'm sure there was a reason for it being shut. But if that's going to happen, could we just maybe make sure that the cleaners have got a sign so that people know what's happening or how long it will be shut for? Thanks. Um, Pauline, can you take that up individually, week, Karen? Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah thanks. Has anyone else? Okay. Um, before I move to recommendations, I, I actually think we need to commend this because this is a tremendous piece of work, excellent piece of work, um, which is still ongoing, by the way. You know, they're still they're still at it. They're still working with the local communities and businesses to to bring things make things even better. Um, and the big thing for me is that there's not a single toilet being closed in this, um, which is what the public said. So we've listened to the public and the excellent work that, uh, from officers and everyone concerned. So. Are we ready to agree the implementation of the new cleaning model across the Friesen Galloway to achieve £78,078 ,078 in savings? That's set out in paragraphs 3.9 to 3.18. Great, thank you. 
and to receive uh, monitoring reports on the Public Convenience Service Review as the progress occurs throughout 20, 2021. I hope you agree with that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karen. Um, we'll move on to item six, the Homeless Service uh, update. Uh, the report provides members with an update on the outcome of the visit by the Scottish Housing Regulator in June July 2019 and seeks approval on the action plan for the recommendations. <coughs> Excuse me. Paragraph 3.2 of the report captures the improvements that have been made to our homeless service, and this goes to the heart of our Council's priority to protect our most vulnerable people. Uh, Lorna Campbell here to take any questions in the report. Uh, be anything to add, Lorna? Are you quite happy to go to questions? Anybody? Any questions in this? No, in that case, then I'm, uh, I'm going to move the recommendations. Um, one is uh, we've considered it. Uh, thank you. Two, note the actions taken so far to address the recommendations. Agree. Approve the action plan to address the remaining recommendations. And 2.4, acknowledge the continuing contributions of the housing options and homeless service in meeting the Council's priority of protecting the most vulnerable people. Um, and I think I'd just like to add to that, not in the, uh, in the minute, but uh, that, that there's no recognition in the current from what there was a few years ago, it's just the improvement's been fantastic, so I think that needs to be recognised, and if you can pass it on to staff, uh, Director. Yeah. Yeah, do so. Thank you. Thanks very much, Donald. Uh, we'll move on to item seven, which is the welfare reform update on universal credit. The report provides members with an update on the rollout of universal credit the local impacts and the wider work being undertaken by the benefits and welfare team. Paula Doherty is here to take any questions. Um, Paula, have you anything you'd like to add? Okay. On page 80, sorry. Yeah. All oh, right, yes, yes, I, yeah, at the end of, not July, yeah. Am I right? Yeah, that's it there. Um, okay, move to questions. John? Hey, thank you, Chair. The table on page 79, the discretionary housing payments table, is rather concerning. If you look at the ongoing universal credit, the first line below that, social sector size criteria, we've jumped from payments of £40,000 in 2016-17 up to almost half a million pounds in this current year. Is that trend continuing? It has, it has to be considered in conjunction with the top, the top line social sector size criteria which has gone down to 861,000 because customers that are impacted by size criteria are moving away from housing benefit and towards universal credit. So the spend in the universal credit DHPs will go up and the spend in housing benefit DHPs will go down. So what's the net? Um... The net position is an increase. Because obviously, as rents increase, the 14% and 25% increases. And there's also a, a, an interesting anomaly with um, universal credit in that more customers who are impacted will be eligible for this support. Thank you. Anyone else? Willie? Yeah, Chair, we're still seeing the misery being inflicted by the universal credit, at least I'm experiencing the, the, the misery uh, of people living in poverty. Well, I think we've got one in four children suffering the effects of poverty. It might even be higher than that, one in three. What I'm really concerned with is 3.6. I'm recognising the, the, the good work of the department, the different teams, uh, and I'm looking at the benefit maximisation team that deal with the over 60s and so forth in conjunction with the uh, Dumfries and Gallery Sentence Advice Service. Uh, I did write to yourself uh, not so long ago when this team felt they were under threat uh, and you did respond 
and indeed uh, Adam did as well, Adam Wilson. Are we, I'm just looking for your reassurance, Chair, that this team is safe, that we are delivering the services uh, and getting the benefits uh, in return for the many people over 60 and that that is not going to be affected, that this team will continue. Uh, yeah, Emily, just for everyone else's information, that, the, that was the template that went out for public consultation that you were talking about. Um, it's very much just that. It was a, a document out for consultation and review. Um, I think it would be safe to say at this moment in time it's not the administration's plan to, um, to do that, but uh, I, I, that's a decision for full council to make when it comes to budget time. Um, so, but thanks for raising it. Right. Anyone else? Jim? Not so much raising anything, Chair. Uh, uh, just looking at the case references or, 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 or the information we're given on page 82. And I think our staff need a great deal of credit for working hard to ensure that clients get the kind of financial support they're entitled to. And I hope that work continues. Paul? <clears throat> OK, thank you. Um, uh, John and I have, have been to see the team as well and did, uh, thanked them, congratulated them on the work they've been doing as well just before Christmas. Um, hmm? And assured them at the time, yep. Yeah. Um, so it certainly wouldn't be the, uh, I think it's fair to say, the administration's um, position. Yeah, that's great. But, uh, but we're, in a, we're in a formal position, so um, a, a process, sorry, so that has to see its course. And of course, be yeah, yeah, it just make, it must make a huge difference to these individuals to know that they're getting support and they actually realise the amount of money that their dues is reinstated to them. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's understood. And uh, the message was passed on very clearly. Anyone else? No, in that case, then I'll move on to the. Sorry, hey, hey, Dougie. Sorry. Thanks, Chair. Uh, just, just very quickly, I just want to uh, thank Paul and her team for the work that they do. The, the, the thing that, about these, this data is what it doesn't reveal is the, the people out there who are living on the edge. And I know from first-hand experience working with constituents who have been supported uh, through Laura's team who wouldn't necessarily end up actually uh, receiving any uh, money from the funds, but the, the support that is provided has helped stabilise families, and I think they should be commended for that. Anyone else? In that case, then we'll move on now to the um, recommendations. And that's, um, we've been asked to note the ongoing work of the Welfare and Housing Options Team, which has resulted in the prevention of uh, 80 evictions, set out at paragraph 3.3. .3. And at 2.2 .2 here, the work of the Benefit Maximisation Team in relation to a small project to support stroke encourage applications for severe disability payment, set out in paragraphs 3.6.1. Happy to note. Thank you very much. Sean. <coughs> Based on the, on the discussion, could we not <coughs> also include in that that we commend the work as well, rather than just noting it? Um, yeah, I've, I've no problem with that at all. If you want to, I have a recommendation to commend uh, the staff for the work that they're doing. And, um, it's actually in the compassionate way they do it, um, is what I think it comes across. So, um, I, I, I'm happy to add that, so uh, as an extra recommendation, you got that? Okay. Um, come through that, and if you can pass on uh, first hand again through Derek to yep. the staff. So, thank you very much. <coughs> uh, we'll move on now to item 8. Um, community Director, elected member engagement, training, consultations, seminars, briefings, and visits. Um, the report outlines proposals for elected member engagement with services within the community's directorate through a range of training, consultation, seminars, briefings and visits program for 2020. Um, I'm very encouraged with the proposals of this paper and it reaffirms the director, directorate's commitment to fully engage elected members in the work activities of the, of the directorate. I'm in no doubt that the program will help us gain a better insight into the services being delivered and the innovative ways in which the directorate is embracing transformation. Um, Derek will obviously take any questions and support. Is there anything you want to add at this stage, Derek? No. So I'm happy to go straight to uh, questions. Jim? Uh, just an observation, Chair, and nothing more. Uh, 
I think the way that the director and other directors now engage with the public is commendable, and I think the public actually appreciate that. And I think it's also good that elected members engage with officers. So I don't have a complaint per se other than to say the EMES system takes away the face-to-face -face or the one-to-one -one contact that I think is important with senior managers and staff. I appreciate the way they engage me when I ask them to, and so do the public, and I think it's worthwhile recognising that. Change isn't always best. I don't like EMES, I'm sure you know that. Yeah. Um, it's just it's your audit trail that you did actually do something, Jim, that for me is the big thing. But uh, anyone else? Uh, Ian? Uh, just a, a contrary view to, to Councillor Dempster. I use EMES a lot, and, and I, I think it's very, very worthwhile. But one criticism, uh, there seems to be more and more when we get responses. We get a response that doesn't really give you an end result. They just say it will be added to work record, and this, this inquiry will close automatically within 10 days. That, I think, that's, I normally put it back and say, no, I think that's up to me to say I'm satisfied, and I'll close it in 10 days if I wish to. So I think it's maybe something that could be well looked at. Thanks for the observation from Councillor Dempster and the comments from Councillor Blake. I uh, just reassure you that I'm absolutely determined that where elected members are not satisfied, you make that clear, and we are determined to bring about improvements. So please be assured that's the, the journey we're on. Uh, there's a recognition that uh, we have made progress. We're not complacent. However, uh, the more you uh, articulate uh, how the response could have been improved, that will help us on that improvement journey. So it's a very helpful feedback, and we'll build on it. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Hey, Willie? Yeah, seeing as being raised here, it's you know, maybe not so much the, the email system, but just officials or the council replying to email. Uh, not always getting them in three days, uh, and worse when it's not within the 15 days. But it's not just the reply, it's the quality of the reply. And as Ian pointed out, you know, he'll determine when the issue is finished. And I think that's right for members. But it's at times the quality of that response that there's not any answer in them. It's just it's being dealt with. That's not what I expect as a member when I'm raising uh, pertinent points and, and, and points that are affected uh, by our constituents. Do you, Chair, reaffirm the point? Thank you, Councillor Scobie, and uh, be assured that where uh, you record uh, the reasons why you're not satisfied, uh, there'll be a learning point on an individual case. We're happy to meet members individually. If there are uh, two or three responses, for example, we'll deal with these as a collective with you individually. So it's just reassuring you, yes, uh, it's uh, embracing technology, but there is a human side to it, I can assure you, and therefore please let us know if there are uh, a number of inquiries that you feel uh, you want to bring to our attention. Do that as an individual member, and we'll work with you to uh, address these. Sean? Yeah, just a, just a quick question on the community conversations. Uh, like, like Jimmy, I, I think they are they're worth persevering with. Uh, I think they will get better. I think they, they are good, you know, for engaging with the community and also with the elected members being in attendance as well. I think maybe, from my understanding, I don't know if other members um, feel the same, but I'd like to see the back end of that process. And, you know, is it, is it universal that it actually formulates um, a summary to a report? Or is there, an, you know, I'd like to see what the end product of all that useful information is generated and where it could potentially go. Um, you know, does it inform decisions at committee? It, it, does it, you know, form other kind of things? So it's really just to kind of get that, that kind of clarified. Okay, you, Chair, thanks. Councillor Marshall, yeah. Uh, indeed, the community conversations are uh, still in, in their infancy in relative terms. They're a new concept and we're all learning as we go along. What's crucial is that we don't just have the conversation, but we record the conversation and we feed that back to the participants. And we're in the process of doing that just now, for example, to the hundreds of people who engaged in the budget uh, position. So it's absolutely essential that we do uh, not just record, we feed back and we learn. And as appropriate, that feedback is then uh, recorded in the appropriate reports that come before committee to ensure 
that in fact we can demonstrate this is what the public have uh, told us and this is how we've responded. And I think the earlier report on public conveniences is a good example where, quite frankly, um, the public have made it clear we value the importance of these services, but they do recognise things have to change. So we've therefore incorporated that. So ongoing uh, improvement, however, certainly a recognition that uh, we have made good progress and we need to continue to, to do so in the, in the months ahead. Okay. Um, David, oh sorry, yeah, sorry, David. Thank you. I think it was in the uh, full council that I asked the, the officer how much the budget um, consultation had cost. And the reply was, well, it costs nothing because it's only officer's time. And I'm not sure whether we should be evaluating the, the equation that way. Um, I'm worried that we sometimes consult too much when it's a very complex issue and we present a very simplistic um, set of information to the public. And I'm also worried that if, if we need to be doing this, then councillors are not doing their job. I think, as I understand it, our job is to know what public opinion is. So um, I think we need to be open to good ideas if, and we, all, we need to know that if people can send in good ideas at any one point, but I'm um, not convinced that, that these consultations um, are actually value for money, but I haven't been able to find out how much they cost, so I'm not um, perfectly placed to judge that. Thanks. Thanks. No, um, do you know anyone else? No. Um, in that case, then, I'm minded to move the recommendations. <coughs> We've been asked to consider the proposals for the community's directorate elected member engagement activities for 2020. That's set in Appendix 2 of the papers. And subject to any additions or amendments, agree the programme. Happy to agree the programme. It so doesn't allow mean we can't add something as, as we go through the business of the, of the, of the year. All right. Thanks very much. Um, moving on now to item number nine. It's the head of service uh, six months assessment um, of roads and infrastructure. The business plan and performance report is by the director. Items 9, 10, 11 and 12 provide members with a six month performance report from each of the heads of service. We will obviously deal with these individually and it will be important to recognise there are some common themes in all of the reports. I want to ask Derek to set the overall context for these four performance reports. Um, and that's across to you, Derek. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, members. Uh, it's probably not to escape your attention. Obviously, we will deal with these reports, as the Chair says, individually. There are some common themes and commonality we need to consider. It's certainly not escaped your attention either that uh, they make up 141 pages. So there's a fair bit of information to be considered. It is only nine months since the Council established uh, the Communities Directorate with its enhanced responsibilities and aligned these to this committee. And therefore, it's a good idea to always take stock of what change and what challenges we've dealt with. Uh, it's easy to say that people are our greatest resource, but for this Council, we need to always have that uppermost in our mind. And for this Directorate, it's not just our staff, it's the people at community level that we actively engage, we've just discussed in ways that we've never done before to ensure their great ideas come to fruition. Equally, those people and those partners are instrumental in helping us deliver the four service plans and the, the six-month uh, position statement we have before us. It's also fair to acknowledge that uh, the directorate moved from having over 600 staff to now having over 1,300, uh, and the variety of staff now range from environmental health, trade and standing office, trading standards officers, through to roads and waste operatives. The budget's increased from 26 million to 64 million, and as we've said, we have four business plans, 92 projects, and 193 performance indicators. So that starts to give scale, volume, and uh, context. It is a significant change, and I would just at this point say, elected members, thank you for your support during this time. It has been uh, a challenging time, a lot of change to take on board, and a lot of new uh, initiatives and a lot of pressures to contend with collectively as members and officers. I'm certainly privileged that I've got four heads of service and the workforce who are passionate about what they do and determined, despite the challenges of budget and austerity, to deliver and improve services. So since just last April, there's a, a lot of things happened. Uh, 
Clearly, these are in the, the four reports. Certainly, highlights worth commenting on. Uh, engaging and working with children in different ways in our two family centres in Stranraer and Dumfries, the successful opening of DG1, engaging over 800 people in our new curbside waste collection arrangements to significantly tackle and improve recycling, 40,000 people attending youth beats, and tackling the uh, climate emergency with an emphasis on active travel. Continued progress in partnership with local communities in establishing our seven inclusive parks and festivals and events ranging from the Oyster, Oyster Festival to Tour of Britain. And currently, we are all enjoying the Big Burns Supper. So yes, all of this is taking place against the backdrop of budget reductions, and this year alone the Directorate is delivering £3 million of savings. That means the need for transformation has probably never been more obvious and a clear example of this being delivered is, in fact, a decision you took last year as members in establishing the community, Keeping Communities Safe model, which has brought together community safety with environmental health and training standards. This has not just improved job enrichment opportunities for its staff, it has also improved the services we deliver to the public, and we can pick that up uh, in due course. But a clear example of doing things differently and not just serving the customer, but improving job enrichment. The Council is committed to promoting the health and well-being of our employees. An essential part of this is a meaningful employee engagement. And I think we should all be pleased that we gave employees the opportunity to engage, for example, in the budget. Over a 1,000 staff got involved in that, and you have uh, access to their feedback, their ideas, their suggestions. So again, I think that is helpful in this new way of working. Clearly, we need to remain an employer of choice. There are a number of measures we can do to achieve that, none other than ensuring that all our supervisors and managers are visible and approachable to their staff, and that we have ongoing effective two-way engagement with our staff. And that's why it's vital, and uh, each head of service has recently established their own staff communication team, and they're helping to drive forward transformation which are absolutely delivered and uh, shaped and influenced by all our staff. So, uh, as you know, self-praise is no praise, um, and that's why we encourage our staff to seek external recognition for their work. And in the last few months, our Welfare and Housing Options team received the accolade of UK Council of the Year for their, way, uh, their ways of tackling poverty and social inclusion. And uh, I can assure you the staff get huge... Uh, benefit, they get huge satisfaction from getting that recognition in terms of their work being valued, as you have discussed earlier today. Also, the Community Planning and Engagement Team were recognised as UK Council of the Year for its commitment to best practice consultation and investment in staff development. So, in conclusion, yes, we need to work differently, but we need to ensure you as elected members can scrutinise the work that we do. And that's why the Audit, Risk and Scrutiny Committee this year will be looking at four services to scrutinise, and we certainly welcome that work coming forward uh, through elected members. But as we saw in the last report, Chair, it's crucial that you are more directly involved in the work that we do at uh, a strategic level and at a ward level. And the earlier report, I think, gives you an illustration of the direction of travel we wish to go. So I do hope that sets a bit of the scene for members, uh, Chairman and uh, more than happy, as we have to, go through each report individually. So, thank you. Thanks, Derek. Um, thanks for the clarification and the amplification. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming that's for all four. No, yes, no, four indeed. No. <laughs> indeed. <laughs> Hi. Um, so, on agenda, agenda item number nine, we're talking about roads and infrastructure services here. We have uh, Stephen Herrick and his team uh, available to answer questions. Um, Thanks, Chair. Uh, I'd like to ask a, a couple of questions in relation to um, projects ongoing. At page 94, um, at 3103, there's reference to the A716 Tremor Road, which we know uh, there was a, a tragedy and loss of life in that road. Um, and I'd be interested to know what the timescales are for having the new road closure arrangements in place. Uh, and the subsequent question is in relation to an email that I sent to Derek the other week um, following uh, a, a flooding incident at Glen Lee on the 10th of December. 
Um, and that was really, really close to being a, a tragedy, uh, but for the actions of local members of the community and emergency services, um, it could have been a lot worse. Uh, I've had the opportunity to speak to James uh, subsequently, and uh, there was reference to perhaps uh, looking at permanent measures that can be put in place at Glen Lee. Um, so my question is, um, will that appear on this six monthly report um, in terms of taking that work forward? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, Councillor Campbell, with respect to the 716, uh, the next stage would be to um, develop the capital uh, strategy for next year, so it will be, uh, be one that will come to uh, committee in March for the capital programme for 2020-2021. Uh, um, so we've, we've developed proposals there for uh, gates and signage and improvements on the diversion route uh, that would be available at times of road closure. Uh, I know that's obviously subject to some element of funding. Um, with the 762, uh, colleagues in engineering and design um, have visited uh, tracks um, at um, Glenlee Power Station and discussed options with them. Um, and I think uh, in, we've, we've got significant support from Police Scotland in terms of implementing road closures. So um, we would be looking to a similar kind of process in terms of uh, probably a formal closure of the road at times when there was indications that the road would be flooded, so it would actually be physically physically shut. But that requires a little bit more work uh, at this stage, but it's building on work on the 716. That, thanks for that, James. And, and I know that very quickly, um, temporary arrangements were put in place to ensure that the road is, is closed uh, swiftly. Um, I uh, have also had meetings with, with Drax, and just to put it on record that, that uh, With respect, this is about a, um, a trunk, a road. This isn't parochial. This is part of the performance. Um, no, with respect, no, it's not. And uh... I, um, as I was ju just going to say, um, there are t uh, temporary arrangements in place. Um, there's no doubt that Drax weren't responsible for the flood, but uh, those that have met with Drax officials will know that over the, the last few decades, rainfall in uh, Galloway has increased by 30%. Uh, we'll not get into a debate uh, with what the causes of that are, but it's a reality, and we're going to see more examples of this. Um, so I look forward to seeing future reports in relation to Glen Lee. Thank you. Thanks for that contribution as the um, council champion for climate change, Thank you. rather than the local councillor. Um, any more questions? Willie, sorry, yeah, and then, sorry, it was Tommy first, then. Thanks, Chair. Uh, you can maybe bear with me a bit, Chair, because what I'm, I'm going to ask a question, something that's not in the papers, so I, and I think maybe it should be. Some time ago, uh, last year or whatever, it came to either this committee or the Finance Committee, about two million shortfall in the, in the roads budget, now, we asked at that time for an external inquiry, but an internal inquiry was called for at the finish. I've never seen the results of that internal inquiry. That, that's still ongoing. How, how long has it got, Chairman? What about it? it quite, to be quite frank, Tommy, it'll take as long as it takes to get the bottom of it. We'll all, we'll all be dead. Tommy, that's the end of the matter, because that's not what this is about today. That's a totally separate thing. You're... You're, you're Might be the end of the for you, Chair. It's not for me. Sorry. Well, we greatly respect. Um, it's uh, it's not relevant to this uh, today. It's a separate thing. It's uh, ongoing. Uh, Willie, what did, what did your question, Willie? Couple, Chair. Uh, first one, just on the back of the A seven one six Dromore, and it's the last sentence in that paragraph: engagement with the community ongoing to ensure ensured emergency access to all potentially impacted. It was just that I did put forward a, a, a suggestion, I didn't even make it into a proposal, but a suggestion that perhaps we should be looking at the, the, the current road that is being closed or, or has been agreed to close in inclement weather and, uh, and heavy uh, tides and, and, and waves from, from the, the seaside. But the, I asked, what's the scope to put the road 
further back into the farmer's field that would then mitigate that potential danger, if you like. And I, I hope that I, that is a consideration or being considered uh, and that we see this in the capital uh, programme uh, that will come in March, as James has indicated. My other point is on 3.9, Chair, and I note contractor appointed for flood mitigation works at Spout Wells. Uh, and I would ask, is the work started as it should have been started uh, at the turn of the year, as this committee was told, not parochial chair, it's just getting clarification. I have written on the point. James? Thanks, Chair. Um, Councillor Scobie, yes, with regards to the uh, the, the question on Strunar, the, uh, the contractor has been appointed. Um, the contractor hasn't given us a start date as yet. Um, there was a there was a query with regards to the um, the design of the pipework, uh, which we've clarified now with the suppliers of the pipework, um, and we will have a, a start date agreed once we've gone back to the contractor today, and an update will be provided to you um, in the next day or so on time scales in that regard. I, I appreciate it's not ideal, but we've awarded a contract to a contractor. Um, and we're somewhat at the mercy of them in agreeing a, a finalised start date. Well, did you went back in? Yeah, Chairman, there wasn't an answer to my first point on the 716, but nevertheless, and I heard what the director was saying, uh, 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 and I recognise uh, all his words, but he finished by self-praise. There's no praise. And this was one that was given by this committee uh, to be treated as an urgent matter and uh, that was uh, then, uh, way back in about October, November time, and, and we're here now that it's not started, and it was uh, scheduled, in my opinion, for the turn of the year, and I made that point. I think when we're given dates, the, the people are affected by this, uh, and we should have made a start, is my opinion, uh, and it just reflect a poor degree of urgency being applied to this. Any comment they can make of that? Because uh, when I responded to you earlier, I said it will be done as soon as it can be done um, with the urgency that it, it required that we agreed, but it would be done within the, the protocols and procedures that were required to follow. Now, um, James, have you any add to that? Nothing further to where we, we've awarded the contract and we're agreeing a start date with the contractor and we're within, within their hands, so to speak. So there we are where we are. Um, I've got David and then John Young. Thank you, Chair. Um, there are many things wrong with the Council, but the expansion of this Director's remit is definitely strengthening the Council, in my, in my opinion. Um, I asked him last time about the scheduling, the possibility of having schedules to roadworks which are publicised so people would know, well, we've got to be patient, but it is coming. And he'd said, yeah, they were working towards that. I'd like to see if there's a progress update on that. And my second question would refer to the um, public waste situation. I went to the, the consultation and there were two other councillors there, but not many members of the public, but the councillors are well informed, as always. And um, I picked up that inert material might be going to Sileth, which seemed a long way to send and, uh, our inert material. Hopefully we can find something better to do with, particularly since it's inert. And um, maybe our bin mountain has gone to England and is being used. And if that were the case, then that would be a, a sort of massive good PR um, story, which we should get out there. Um, thank you. Uh, okay, I, I'm picking two questions out of that. One was about the um, publicising the public uh, the order things were getting done. I know that email comes to councillors about um, uh, roads and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, in my experience, it's, it's well since I've opened one, but in my experience, it just said scheduled or programmed. It never had a date in it, and it's the, it's the date that's missing. Yeah. Stephen, can we look at that? Yeah. yeah we'll, we'll review the uh, the weekly information that's going to elected members just to make sure that there's there's that accuracy in terms of actual schemes coming forward uh, and the actual time scales. We also oh, we do have that. We do have forward looking dates for. All things that are in the pipeline, because that would be that would be great news. If we, if that's true. In terms of everything that's in the pipeline, we what, what we have is within the capital monitoring reports, we have a list of all the schemes that have taken forward under the capital program. 
and that capital programme. We don't set dates against that. That's a further subject to uh, applying resources, applying subcontract resources, looking at contracts where that's necessary, and scheduling the works, uh, as well as notification through the, uh, the Roadworks Register to comply with the, the new Roads and Street Works Act. We have to give notification in advance going forward. And it's at that point that we start to nail down the actual start dates for the schemes that we're bringing forward. And that is what will feed into, or what feeds into the updates to elected members for the kind of, the week ahead on the, on the roadworks. I, I, I don't know why I put words in your mouth, David, but I think you were meaning as well the sort of public, so it's public facing. If, if, yeah, sorry, I'll, yeah, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, yeah. excuse me, but if, you know, an incident would be somebody says, well, you know, that road in um, Cotton Street was the example, actually, because Bomi, the day after, I said, well, that was in the pro or programmed, but no one ever knew when it was coming. Literally the day after, work started in it, and I, I had no way of knowing that. Um, I think your point's actually well made, and I'm wondering how we can best accommodate that information, but because the public need to know it as well, absolutely, because. Uh, yeah, the shopkeepers, everyone, and, and I know that the department works closely with local businesses. They did a bit near my house quite recently. They came to the door and said, this is what's got to be happening. So um, it's not all doom and gloom, it's not all bad, but I think you're right, we can improve on it, I think, is, is the message. Um, uh, John, John? Well, thank you, Chair. The average number of days lost per, for the staff are about 50% higher than the target. And I know staff can be absent for a variety of reasons, strains, illnesses, etc. But as the director said, the council's going through a time of great change and change is stressful. Are we content that we're doing enough to monitor the mental health and well-being of the staff in the council? I'm going to let Derek come in that because uh, it's a council-wide, it's actually a region-wide issue, not just for every employer. But uh... Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Councillor Young. Yeah. Uh... I think we do a lot, but we need to do more, we need to do better. Uh, we're asking people, I think there was recent evidence across all employees way, way beyond the council that uh, the more we progress technology, people are having to, to work uh, more, uh, and whether they're measuring that or not, but just on phones at different days, at the, of times of the day, weekends, etc. So there's all sorts of pressures and demands on, on our employees. The more we work differently, the more we involve people, rather than just simply uh, take the judgment of professional officers. That, that puts additional new ways of working, changes that for some people may be difficult to adjust to. So in the overall terms, it's also important to recognise the demographics of our region uh, is reflected in our workforce, and therefore uh, that reflects uh, an ageing uh, workforce, which again have different circumstances that we need to take account of in terms of managing their absence, including uh, responsibilities for carers, as well as uh, the challenges and strains that daily life presents to all of us that at different times uh, we have to deal with. So not all illness is necessarily solely directed to the working environment. There are other uh, external factors that influence it. So Council certainly has a charter around well-being uh, of our employees, uh, just like NHS is working with us on social prescription. We are doing the same by uh, promoting active lifestyles. But again, uh, if you work actively, not all council staff are office-based, the vast majority aren't, uh, it's important that we don't just see the solution as uh, being healthy and active in terms of being out and about. Uh, there are other ways that we need to uh, work with our employees. So I think we've, we've made good progress. I think the managing absence, the more uh, we make it uh, acceptable that people are open and honest about how they're feeling and some of the, the stresses they may have. I think that's a good thing, but we then have to accept that might have an adverse impact on our monitoring and the information we receive. In summary, I would far rather we have an honest uh, profile of the, the absence of our employees, actively monitor it, but be open to the fact that uh, in this modern workforce the, the challenge uh, is is there for everybody as it is in wider lifestyle in society. So big issue, full of uh, complexity, complexity, no easy answers, but be assured uh, we are trying our best to work uh, at the cutting edge of this in terms of best practice and we'll continue to monitor it and make sure that members uh, are fully sighted on uh, everything that we're doing. Um, I, I'd just like to add to that. But uh, Andrew and I are on the IGB, and uh, the same's coming across for the NHS, the uh, third and independent sectors. Uh, one of the things that 
I'm particularly concerned about is why we would have um, a figure. Uh, I, I, I totally understand because it's almost like we're guessing how many people have got to be off in the well. Um, I'd be much happier seeing a retrospective figure telling us what the figure actually was, right? And then that would give us a better idea. And also, if it really reflected everything in that person's life, right, not just their work. Um, well, we've got a, a definite bit under the, uh, the uh, Richard's team uh, working with uh, uh, health colleagues to just enrich everybody's life and uh, make, it, make it better. Uh, and we can actually see uh, it also ties in with the extra um, admissions to the hospital. Okay, so there's a much, much bigger picture here rather than you can shake your head, David, but that's the facts. Yeah, um, I, I clearly didn't agree with it, but uh, that's your right to disagree. Okay, so anyone else? No, in that case, we'll go to the recommendations. Um, we've been asked to review the six month summary of performance for the Roads and Infrastructure Service Business Plan for 1st of April 19th, of September 19, which includes the performance information on health and safety and the management of the risks within the service risk register, it's Appendix 1. We've reviewed that. Um, 2.2, to scrutinise the exception reporting and consider whether the actions proposed are adequate to improve performance in future monitoring of areas which have not met the target, Appendix 2. So we've done that and then agree the proposed amendments to current business plan measures that are set out in Appendix 3. So we're happy with that. Thanks very much. Thanks, team. Um, we'll move on to item number 10. Um, so it's the Head of Service six month assessment, 1st of April 19th, that's September 19th, of the Safe and Healthy Community Service Business Plan and performance report by the Director of Communities. Again, it's uh, Richard here. The report is to present members with the six month assessment of the progress on the delivery of the Safe and Healthy Community Service Business Plan. The report also provides more detailed information on health and safety performance. Uh, Richard is here to take any questions. Um, and I'm assuming Derek, we don't need to, Derek set the preamble for yeah, um, everyone at uh, the start of the, uh, these reviews. So I'm ready to go straight to, um, yeah, Jim. Thanks, Chair. A, a couple on page 126, 3.10.2. I'd occasion to speak to Mark Malloy about youth work in my area. And in particular, disappointed to learn that Mark and his team put in a significant amount of work to try and provide activities. And in some cases, not one young person signed up. So this is not a reflection on the work that those staff do. It's an observation on how our young people engage with those staff and whether there's a are failing particularly in my ward or the type of activities that were arranged, I don't know. But Mark put in, and his team put in a significant amount of work and no one appeared to be interested. So I would suggest he should maybe focus his, his activities elsewhere if folk are no interested, but be interested on a personal level to know why there was such a lack of interest because I would have thought that the fact that your staff put in an amount of work that someday would have been interested enough to uh, explore the opportunities. But again, absolutely no reflection on our staff, it's just an observation. The other thing is 3.11.3 on the same page, and I'm really exercised about this, and that's challenging given my shape that I'm exercised about anything. But uh, dog fouling, we have earned uh, some income on 26 dog fouling tickets. You'd get that in my high street in a day. And there is a serious public issue, a public concern about dog fouling. And the point I want to make here is, and again, this is praise, if you like, for the council. Uh, we have a member of staff committed to installing CCTV systems in some of the communities across the region. They're up and working. The team member or, or, or the officer responsible tells me, the quality is very good. I've approached the police and they refuse to view the images to issue fixed penalty tickets to the offenders. So we have a situation where this council has spent significant amounts of money at the request of the police to install CCTV 
And then the police refused to go and view it to identify the culprits and prosecute them. And there is absolutely no doubt that that approach, were it to be adopted, would work and the offenders would be punished accordingly. And it's absolutely unacceptable that this situation continues and that we don't seem to be working in partnership. I don't, I don't know the law. I presume that community wardens would not be allowed to go and view privately a CCTV, public space CCTV, but I don't know. However, if they can, that might be an opportunity to try and deal. It won't fix the problem, but it will certainly send a strong message to the culprits if in some locations, in other towns and villages across Dumfries and Galloway, that punishment is meted out if they don't, these individuals don't exercise their duty to remove dog fouling. And we know that we give out free dog fouling bags, absolutely free of charge. There's no excuse financially or otherwise why people don't clean up behind the dogs. I do behind mine. Okay, before I let Richard in, one of the things, your suggestions there in actual fact, which it's resonating with me, is that members don't really know what the fixed penalty regimes are and what the different things that people can do. And I'm actually wondering if that's something could be added to that programme we agreed earlier in the so we can advise councillors better on what our, our team can actually do, right? Or whether it has to be a Police Scotland matter, which, with the greatest respect, Jim, I can't do much about, but rather than lobby, right? So that's another issue again. Um, and when you talk about my high street, I'm, I'm assuming you mean all the high streets in your ward? Yes, I just no, had, no, 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 I I just had to live question. in the high street and, and I see it, but no, it's a common theme. Yeah. I yeah. attend a lot of community councils and that's a yeah. common theme amongst yeah. community council members is mm -hmm. dog fouling. And you yeah, know, you yeah. have it around schools and school playgrounds and public yeah, yeah, places yeah, yeah. and it's not an occasional thing. We've got it. It's a routine. Yeah, I, absolutely. We, we've got the message. It was, um, Richard, I, can you pick some of that up here? <laughs> Not literally, Chair. <clears throat> yep, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for the comments, uh, Councillor Dempster. Um, certainly in terms of uh, the youth work uh, comment to start off with, um, the activities, services, the target intervention programmes that, that Mark's team very successfully deliver across the region are very much um, targeted around the, uh, the 10,000 voices exercise we did around young people and what young people wanted in terms of their respective areas. Um, obviously, a lot of that work is aligned with the anti-poverty agenda uh, and some of the other early intervention programmes that we're, we're delivering. Um, I'll speak to Mark and the team, and we'll uh, we'll look at the, the specific uh, area as mentioned and uh, and pick that up with you uh, out with the, the the meeting, if I may, Councillor Dempster. Um, in regard to uh, the uh, the dog fouling issue, um, I think that as a consequence of the keeping communities safe review uh, that the, the director referred to in his introduction. Uh, we will see uh, an increase in uh, presence across the whole of the region as a consequence of this integrated com keeping communities safe function um, that will be rolled out um, uh, starting uh, next month. We've now completed all of the, the recent uh, recruitment exercises in regard to that. Uh, one of the other areas that is about to transfer to that team um, is CCTV uh, and, uh, and the links to CCTV and how we utilise that uh, as a means of supporting the activities and the functions that the Keeping Communities Safe team, um, and that's the protection team, which includes uh, training standards, environmental health, licensing standards officers and private registered landlords, as well as community safety and resilience, will use to enable us to target these types of uh, activities and, uh, and issues. Um, very important for us, uh, indeed, at page 151 of the report, uh, members will have noticed the, the, the um, incident of uh, violence uh, in regard to uh, members of uh, the team. And that specifically was, would you believe, a, an issue in regard to a uh, community safety team challenging uh, a member of the public around dog fouling. Um, so it's certainly high on our agenda and I, uh, I'll certainly take on board that and feedback uh, uh, through, uh, through yourselves and certainly pick up the, the issue of the elected member seminar chair. That's a very good suggestion and one I'd be delighted to take up. Um, could, just Jim, before I let you back in, actually I'm thinking that might be better be a, like an aid memoir or something to come out because it would be a fair bit of expense, something that could actually be emailed out to everybody. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's, and, and the beauty of it doing it electronically means it can, when the legislation changes, that it can change quite simply. Um, um, 
Jim, Jim, you wanted back in? Hey, just briefly, Chair, just I will speak to Richard, Richard o, o, offline, but uh, just to say that Mark and his team do a tremendous job. And in fact, what I wanted to say was, so did the community service team, uh, uh, the, 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 the community safety team, because they work, they're working at the moment uh, uh, in partnership with the police on an antisocial behaviour situation up in my ward. I know many of them personally, and they do a tremendous job. So again, it's no criticism of the staff. It's just simply that if they don't see the, the individual with a the dog, there's nothing they can do. But there is evidence now stored where I believe something should be done. But I'll speak to Richard offline, Chair. Thanks again for letting me back in. No problem. Anyone else? Uh, yes, Ben. Thank you, Chair. Um, I would like to congratulate Richard on the active sports activity that's been done, especially in areas where there are lack of facilities. That, that program has been going down brilliantly. On an aside... Richard, if I could speak to you or email you later, there was an initiative that I um, acted upon after complaints about woods that are not council owned and we worked with the Forestry Commission on specific signage that was cheaply done actually and it's working a treat so I'll get back to you on that but these wee small signs have worked effectively so thank you. Thank you. Um, Dougie Campbell and then Willie. Thanks, Chair. <clears throat> Just a couple of questions, Richard. The bottom of page uh, 133, uh, reference to adult participants and over the page council activity sessions through social prescribing. I'm just interested to know, did the NHS, do they contribute financially to, to that physical activity uh, provision? And how widely uh, is social prescribing being used? Is this, is this a, a initiative that's happening in specific areas or is it something that's it's starting to be picked up across the, the region. And the second question, um, bottom of page 134, um, in relation to uh, first, uh, first responder groups. Um, uh, this is a project in conjunction with NHS and Scottish Ambulance Service. I know that previously there's been uh, uh, projects to establish first responder groups, but one of the, the issues that I've certainly been made aware of has been ongoing support for these groups and also retention uh, and very quickly uh, these, these groups uh, disband. Uh, this is a two-year project and I'm just wondering if, if uh, these specific, specific problems are, are being looked at to try and address those, those particular issues. Thanks. Yeah, through you, Chair. Thanks, Councillor Campbell. Uh, certainly in terms of the social prescribing activity and, and functions We've been very successful at uh, working with our NHS colleagues, um, specifically targeting uh, targeted in intervention at, at areas like cancer, diabetes, cardiac rehab, smoking cessation. The recent activity and discussions we've had with our NHS colleagues have been more um, around expanding the, uh, the social prescribing um, uh, service, if you like, to be more generic aligned with GP referrals. Um, we, we, we made a presentation to uh, the Director of Public Health in regard to how we might uh, extend and enhance the program so that we can, uh, we can really roll that out in a more generic way. But we do get funding, but, they are, but it is specific to those targeted intervention programs at present. But as I say, uh, we're hoping to extend that uh, and expand that uh, as, as a key area of development uh, in the very near future. Um, in regard to the, the second point, um, uh, I think it's picked up in the exception reports uh, uh, as well. Um, we have um, re-engaged with Scottish Ambulance Service uh, and community providers. Uh, we had a meeting uh, the week before last. Uh, we've now got a plan of action that will now see this programme uh, immediately start, uh, both in terms of uh, the first responder group uh, and indeed uh, the, the other areas that are aligned with that. So uh, happy to report back uh, positive progress and, and we'll, we look forward to taking that forward with, with partners. Okay, just before I let you in, Willie, just two things. Uh, Richard, j just on that, we know there's a big change in the public health, uh, how it's going to be delivered and everything else. So do we get an assurance that our team here are actually in, actively involved in how it's got to map out across the police in Galloway, um, rather than coming in the coattails? Uh, yes, Chair, happy to give you that assurance uh, through the, the wellbeing team and colleague Lee Seaton. We're actively involved in those discussions. Thanks very much for the assurance. Willie? Yeah, Chair, I note in the report uh, that there are only two that are marked down as, uh, you know, given rise for concern, alert, and, and so forth. One is you know, on the freedom of information responses, 
uh, and not meeting the target date. But the other one gives me rise for concern that will come as no surprise to Richard when I raise this, and it's to the average number of days lost uh, for all other local government employees through sickness, absence, non-teacher, in, in bracket, on page 139. Uh, and really, th th this is reported, or has been reported, to the Joint Safety Committee, and then to Audit and Risk. But from there, it doesn't seem to have a common thread. The reason I'm raising this is more to do with the, the cause and effect. And perhaps to what Derek said earlier, in the number of employees that are reduced, where we're asking uh, uh, people to do more, if you like, with less in the service, and a lot down to, that has been reported to the Joint Safety Committee on stress and stress levels. It's really the cost and effect so that we get an understanding of not just reporting that it's above or, or, or almost double the target uh, set, but also what the cost and effect is on these people having to go off on, on long-term absence and longer than the period as stated there. We see a figure, but we don't see the cost and effect. I would like to see it as a common thread through all the, the, the committees so that we get an understanding. Um, before you come in, Richard, the, the points well made, Willie, but we went through that in great detail in the one before. Um, I, so rather than going through the whole thing again, Richard, can you kind of give uh, Willie a summary of where we are um, rather than going through the whole shooting match and we can discuss it outside or you can discuss it with the, the team later, Willie. Okay. Yeah, thank, thank you, Chair. Just, just in addition to the Director's comments previously, um, I, I think uh, um, we talked about the staff communications team and the, the establishment of separate staff, staff communications teams in each and every area of the Directorate. Um, I'm delighted with, that, uh, that, that the staff comms team within Safe and Healthy Communities uh, has now met on two occasions, and the staff involved from across the whole range of services have highlighted this very issue, Councillor uh, Scobie, uh, and particularly around mental health and well-being, uh, and to get a better understanding of the cause and effect, um, and and the interrogation of the data that we get from uh, human resource colleagues. So we're coming up with some some uh, targeted intervention uh, programs that the team themselves are developing, um, having had those conversations back in the workplace. So uh, really looking to to take this forward in a in a, in a very prog positive and, and progressive way. Just to summarise, Willie, as well, what we talked about when you, you, you obviously had other business for a wee while um, was to look at the uh, if the if the person was prepared to do so in the holder, look at their, all their circumstances because it might not always necessarily be uh, either work might necessarily be not necessarily be the stressor. It might be a combination of work and uh, personal or whatever or health, uh, whatever it might be. So we had a, a real thrash out at that when you were out the room. So if you don't mind, we could. Um, I think. Has Richard covered that enough for you? Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, let's move to recommendations then. Um, the, we're asked to one review the six-month summary of performance for safe and healthy communities service business plan, first of April 19 to 30th of April, September 19, uh, including the performance information on health and safety and the management of the risks within the services risk register. That's Appendix 1, which we've done. 2.2, scrutinise the exception reporting and consider whether the actions proposed are adequate to improve performance and future monitoring of areas which have not met the target. That's Appendix 2. And then finally, 3 is to agree the proposed amendments to the current business plan measures set out in the appendix. Okay, agreed. Thank you very much. Thanks, Richard. Okay, we move on to um, item number 11, uh, Heads of Service six-month assessment, 1st April 19, 3rd September 19, of neighbourhood services and community planning and engagement services, and the business plan 1923 performance, report by the director, we've got uh, Harry and Liz here as well, to answer questions. The report is to present members with the six-month assessment of the progress on the delivery of the neighbourhood services and community planning engagement business plan, the report also provides more detailed information on health and safety performance. Um, and I'm minding to go straight to questions. David. 
Go on then, I'll help you. Um, I see here that legal services is under the remit of the Communities Committee. Um, and I think that the Achilles heel of the Council is its um, contract making skill. It's weak, and that shows up when we have our biggest disasters. Um, which committee is responsible for reviewing that and potentially strengthening that ability? Liz? Yes, it's part of the Democratic Services uh, Business Plan, which is the next item, so we'll certainly come on to that. Hey, thanks, Chair. I've one or two questions or, or, or observations, call them what you will. Uh, I had an issue or, or a question posed to me a few weeks ago, and it's about, well, it's on 3.8.2 in page 163, the major f events and festival strategy. I absolutely support what we're doing, and that's right. But I had an inquiry about what do we do about other, what, what this individual described as a very successful event, which is the Southwest Coastal 300 route. And if you talk about the Northeast 500, it's awash with tourists because they have a, a drive to go and do a 500 mile route in their motorcycle or car or bicycle. And it puts a major a, a financial contribution to the local economy. And this Southwest 300 stretches from Langham right up through Stranraer and then to, to my ward. So there's a there's a real incentive there to ensure that something like that gets supported. And the question was, how is that supported? And I might get that answer offline. I just raise it here for you, Chair, for your your information. The other thing is on page... Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, I mean, certainly that, that type of marketing initiative, I guess, which is probably more what you could class it as than a specific event, uh, but nonetheless, um, collaboration, good practice, uh, potential sources of funding to support that type of thing is exactly uh, what's included in the overall um, events and festival strategy. So if there's a contact, Jim, offline, quite happy to uh, provide that advice. That's brilliant, Harry. Thanks very much. Next next question, Chair, is... Uh, on page 169, and it's introduced a new clean DNG initiative with communities to improve street cleaning, including a renewed focus on getting basic maintenance correct from weed free paths to better maintenance of bus shelters. Uh, observation first I was attended two different community councils last week, and in both of them, the council was complimented on the street cleaning regime that, that's currently in place. and. Uh, the comment was, what a difference, uh, and it's great to see that our staff are out there doing high-profile work within the communities. But my question is about the maintenance of bus shelters. Some of them are, are, are an absolute disgrace. Uh, they are green, they're graffitied, they're dirty. And Swiss Strands at one time had a £10,000 budget to a fund or pay us to clean these bus shelters. I don't know where that is now, but I do think that it's quite right to be reflected in this report that it's something that has to be addressed because clearly it's, uh, it's important to the local communities that the bus shelters and the, 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 the street furniture, as it's known, is in a reasonable state of repair through especially towns and villages. And, and currently, in some cases, it's no. I've had to ask criminal justice to go and clean one in my ward because it's so bad and there isn't apparently a scheme or a methodology currently in place or a regime for cleaning bus shelters. I've only one more chair if you want to allow me to do that and then Harry can maybe deal with them all. It's about uh, our work in the, the contingency plan and the monuments and cemeteries identified as posing significant risk of made safe through lowering or laying flat. Absolutely right. The only plea I would make is that we might put it with the right and facing up in case members of the family at some stage come looking for their memorial stones because currently they're laid down in whatever position they fall or they're inclining on. So if we're doing that, can we try and make sure that the, the text or the, the, the inscription is face up? Yeah, that's fairly easy to sort, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and that's part of the rolling programme um, we've got into 
to make the graveyard safer. Yeah. So, no problem with that, uh, Mr. Howie. Ian. Uh, thanks, Stuart. It's uh, regarding volunteering strategies. Uh, concerns been raised by community councils. You go to that. Uh, any efforts that they're making regarding some issues under community resilience, they're learning that they're perhaps not covered by the council's insurance. And it's just uh, seeking assurances that any work which comes within uh, uh, basically community resilience, they will in fact be covered. So I'm, I'm assuming you mean uh, self-gritting and stuff like that, yeah. Right, self-gritting, uh, litter picks, and uh, the other was uh, doing good pathway clearance. Um, I'm kind of looking at Harry and Liz. I'm not sure if that's their portfolio. It might Certainly be. we do provide advice to community councils about their public liability insurance um, and when they are undertaking a particular piece of work um, with the street scene operatives, there is certainly a conversation about making sure that the right insurances and arrangements are in place. For example, making sure that they've had the correct training in any equipment um, that we provide them with. Harry, can, we can probably pick this up offline because uh, this is a region-wide issue. I appreciate it's been very locally raised with you. So can we do some research and find out exactly what the situation is um, uh, rather than guess? I think it's probably the best way to put it, yeah. So can we do that, Harry, yeah? Thank you. Anyone else? No, nope. in that case, we'll move to recommendations. 2.1, again, is review um, review the um, six-month summary of performance of the Neighbourhood Services and Committee Planning and Engagement Service business plan for the period 1st of April 19 to the 30th of September 19. It includes the performance information on health and safety and the management of the risks within the services uh, risk register, Appendix 1. 2.2, scrutinise the exception reporting and consider whether the actions are adequate. That's uh, Appendix 2, and then agree the proposed amendments to the current business plan measures, which are set out in Appendix 3. Have you agreed? Thank you very much. Thanks, Harry. Thanks, Liz. So we'll move on to item number 12. Um, it's uh, still uh, Liz and I see Richards with her. Um, heads of service six month uh, assessment, democratic services and communities business management business plan 2019 2023 performance. Report is to present members with the six month assessment of the progress on the delivery of the democratic services and the community's business management. The report also provides more detailed information on health and safety performance. Again, um, unless you've entered the item, I'll be moved straight to questions. David? Yes, apologies. I was on 12 a moment ago. <laughs> I'm still, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, our, our ability to make contracts is, is absolutely vital. It can never be too good. And I think it's been too weak in the past. And uh, it's not something that I've seen discussed at any of the committees that I've been on. And I must you know, plead guilty to not having uh, addressed this point either, having long since identified it as the biggest problem the council has. I, I should have done something about it before now. Yep, uh, you'll certainly see in page 216 um, and highlighted at paragraph 311.1 .1, that we are working to improve certain aspects of legal services. And one of the ways we're doing that is the um, introduction of a know-how system for legal services which provides them with um, up-to-date information, training and briefings, and I'm sure contracts um, will be part of that. The, the team do work well with the procurement and commissioning uh, team as well, but we can certainly take these points that you're making um, on board. And the other project, not highlighted in the key factor, factors, but one of the pieces of work we're also doing is about a framework for legal services, about how we access external legal services. So these pieces of work are ongoing, and I'm sure we'll address some of the comments that you're making. Yeah, just real, really quick, my impression is, and again, I haven't dug into this deeply, I've only looked at maybe two contracts in the whole time, and I, I was involved in making a lot of contracts, albeit abroad in a slightly different field, but it always started off with uh, famine, pestilence, war, fraud, everything, and at the end, there's sort of icing on the cake, it might go well, and then this will happen. 
whereas the contracts I've seen from our, that we've made are somewhat blue-eyed in as much as they don't look at it that with that extremely pessimistic view. And then when something does go wrong, we're not ideally placed. So that, that culture is one that I would, would advocate, this pessimistic approach to, to contract making. And um, I think there are, there are skills out there in the, in the private sphere, and perhaps we need to contact our private colleagues you know, who are really doing big uh, contracts and, and getting away with them uh, all the time and in a good way, and to, to actually bring that expertise. That's probably something that councillors could, could do more to help. But it's, uh, it's, it's just something that we can't afford to get wrong, uh, because when we do, uh, the consequences are massive and lead to lots and lots of cuts to compensate. I think that's noted. So I think what you're saying is you, you'd rather be risk averse than risk aware. You've got to assume that things will go wrong usually because they do, um, and therefore you, it's so much better when you've got a decent piece of paper in your hand when when things do go wrong. Uh, absolutely, it's the what ifs. Yeah, that's what you tighten up on. Anyone else? No, in that case, then I'm going to move. Sorry, Sorry. Uh, really briefly, uh, one contract I looked at. It was uh, it. it there was then a problem, and the uh, contractor was arguing that we'd failed uh, to lay out the specification properly. And we were sort of uh, taking a sort of mea culpa uh, attitude there that we should have, yes, we did miss something out of the contract, whereas if we'd gone for a simpler contract style where we said, we need this um, item to do that, and if you fail, it's your fault, we'd have been in a better position than if we'd um, had to be experts who knew exactly what needed to be done to deliver what we wanted. Have I made that clear? Yeah, can I just ask, is this an ongoing complaint? Is this an ongoing complaint? Um, I don't know if it's been settled. It came up a year ago, but it was, in, it was an example of the, the cultural attitude wrong with our contract making. So we were trying to um, over-specify instead of um, having a need which needed to be fulfilled and, and making a contract as if we were not experts. It's better to make it if you're not an expert and shift the burden onto the contractor. Because if you go halfway and you miss out a detail, then you're wide open, as we were in this particular incident. And I, I, you know, I must apologize, because I've only looked at a couple of contracts we made, but that was definitely the problem in this case, where we were in, a, in not a great position because we'd half specified the details, and we shouldn't have gone into the details conversation at all. So that was, that was my other tip on the contract. Okay, your, your content's noted, obviously, and it's on, on the record. Is there anything else? John? Okay, thank you, Chair. I note the taxi card scheme. Is the uptake for that scheme fairly constant? Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, uh, yes, um, we have uh, details of the, the current uh, delivery of the taxi card scheme, which I'm quite happy to, to share uh, with members. Obviously, um, what we're looking to do at the moment is, is review the current arrangements, um, and uh, we'll be looking to take that forward as part of the work packages and transformation programme moving forward, Chair. Okay, so the answer is for another place, John, basically, but uh, it's under consideration just now. Okay, so um, we'll move to recommendations then. Uh, again, it's the review of the six months. I'm not going to read the whole thing again. So are we happy uh, with 2.1? We've reviewed uh, the report. 2.2, um, we've scrutinised the exception and considered the actions proposed are adequate. And then three, are we agreeing the proposed amendments to the current business plan measures? Great. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, folks. Um, moving on to item number 13. It's the report updates members on the priority status given to the Friesen Galloway by Tennis Scotland and Sports Scotland in regard to transforming Scottish Indoor Tennis Fund. It also outlines a proposed partnership approach for securing external match funding to deliver an indoor regional tennis centre at the King George V Leisure Complex at no capital cost to the Council and to request members agree to proceed with external funding applications for a regional indoor tennis centre. Um, I've got Richard and Lee Seaton here to answer any questions. Or is there any update uh, we've got? Uh, nothing to add to the report, Chair. Happy to take questions. Okay. Uh, Sean? Yeah, whilst I, I welcome the, the prioritisation of, of, of Dumfries and Galloway, uh, when I looked at 3.8, the options pr appraisal preferred location, just a little bit disappointed as, as, a, as a council represents another area that, you know, to no surprise, you know, that Dumfries is selected again. Um, and there's obvious reasons why something like that would go to Dumfries. 
But within the within the the kind of the things that were looked at for the preferred location, there didn't seem to be any cognizance of of where tennis is is popular um, within the region because that might have provided an opportunity for maybe ensuring that the facility when it's built will be best used. Um, and the reason why I'm saying that is that certainly throughout Andale and Estale, there's tennis clubs throughout, uh, and in Annan they've just you know revamped the courts there. They've got disabled tennis going. They've got children's programs. There's also the opportunity to actually attract uh, and boost the local economy from near neighbour and local authorities that maybe don't have facility as well. So, whilst I understand why Dumfries has been selected as as per usual, um, I just I'm just disappointed that there was no consideration taken of of where tennis is 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 predominantly popular within our region. And again, it just seems to be that Dumfries is the is the choice again. Um, I think it's important, and I, uh, when I was asked this on local uh, radio quite recently, this wasn't a council decision to cite it there. It wasn't even the local tennis community's decision to cite it there, um, or potentially cite it there. This is the end result of a large consultation exercise between Tennis Scotland, um, some funders, and um, a, 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 an organisation they brought in to look at options of appraisals, but I'll let Lee, um, um, if there's anything to add to that, but that was my understanding. Hmm? Tommy, you the same point? Yeah, it's about Sonarno, haven't it? Yeah. No, no, it's actually about the rest of Dumfries and Galloway. <clears throat> you know, I mean, to say that the, the options appraisal has identified KG5 leisure complex as the preferred option. Where is the option appraisal? Don't even have it. Usually, we would at least go through the motions of sticking in Sankar and Annan and Sunran, Dumfries, where we knew it was going to go anyway. We're not even bothering to go through the motions now. We're just going straight to Dumfries. Okay, Lee can, or, or Richard, can you actually outline exactly what the process was for the recommendation coming forward from Tennis Scotland to cite it there? So we can scotch the myth once and for all, right? This was not a local decision. This was the people who want to build it. No, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that. It's just that there's nothing in the report to suggest, you know, you know, the information you've got is something I wasn't aware of. It's in here, actually. Lee, can you, or Richard, can one of you deal with that, please? Yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair, uh, and certainly uh, understand uh, the comments and members' concerns. I, I think um, from, from our perspective, when we were approached by Tennis Scotland and Sports Scotland um, uh, to inform us that we've been identified as a, as a priority area, um, that was obviously a, a, a significant benefit and a good news story. The criteria and the requirements that are required of the Council in order to draw down that funding are prescribed by Tennis Scotland and Sports Scotland and, and that required uh, that independent assessment in terms of the options for uh, service delivery and where this facility should be sited. Um, we uh, did certainly engage with all of the tennis community across the region um, as part of the, the, the tennis development group. Um, we obviously provided information um, from uh, to, to the to ECOS, the company who undertook that survey, on behalf of Tennis Scotland and Sports Scotland uh, of the range of activities, services uh, and facilities that we've got specific to tennis across Dumfries and Galloway and, and it was very much their um, requirement and recommendation that catchment area, population, transport links and educational impact um, would be better served in the, in the uh, investment in Dumfries. However, uh, I must stress members that we see this as a regional tennis uh, indoor centre and we will be doing all we can to work with uh, the development initiative and, and colleagues and service delivery partners across the region to make sure that the, uh, the usage is maximised by uh, tennis players uh, throughout Dumfries and Galloway it will not just be a Dumfries facility. Thanks very much. Um, is it 3.8 in the report, Sean? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, you got it. Yeah. Jim, you want in? Come back to you. Yeah, I've been given that further information, but um, that basically doesn't tell you, you know, how the decision was formed. Um, 
Okay, Jim, do you want it as well? Thanks, Chair. I do just to say that, 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 that I accept the report and that that's absolutely fine. But it might be useful at some time in the future if members were to receive a report on what type of facilities are actually located in different towns and villages across the region, just to see if there's a gap and how that gap might be addressed. I don't want to be parochial today. Richard knows about it anyway, but uh, I've had my plenty of chances for being parochial earlier today. <laughs> but uh, that, that we should, though, be aware as elected members where the gaps are, and then there'd be an opportunity to maybe look at how we might address that. So nothing to do with this report. It's absolutely fine. But uh, in future, we could maybe get a report on where are the different types of... Because as far as I understand it, there are 12 all-weather pitches in Dumfries. And there's none, none where I live, but that's just maybe no, no unusual across the region. No, no all-weather tennis pitches, tennis courts, Jim. It's tennis we're talking about today. Um, Ian? It's no longer required. I've actually read it in the report myself. Thank you. Thanks very much. So we ready to move to Tommy? Very briefly, Chair. I'd just like to ask that in future, when options appraisals are being done on any items, that we are informed that they're taking place and at least have the opportunity to input to them. Um, I would think, normally I would say 100% agree with that, but the options appraisal was actual part was for Tennis Scotland, and uh, um, wasn't there a council options appraisal, if I'm right? Can you just double, double check with that? Lee, is that the case? Yeah. So it wasn't our option. If uh, Tennis Scotland want to keep the council in the dark then, or at least the elected members. No, oh, well, that's a comment, uh, Tommy, but uh, I, I, for one, would welcome the investment and the trust they're putting in us. Um, yeah. um, and I find it really quite despairing that we've got a chance here and um, we're, we're, uh, we're quibbling about it. So, uh, uh, Sean, no, no, I'm, I'm not talking about you. Right? Yeah, certainly, no, this is, this is great news. Uh, you know, I'm not quibbling about anything. I'm just saying that when I looked at the information on the report, it wasn't clear. There's been an explanation, and there probably has been an opportunity for clubs across the D&G to feed in, but there's not enough there for me to kind of say, well, you know, there, I would expect it more rather than just the options that, that's been outlined. I thought they would have taken consideration where, you know, location, etc. cetera. Um, and, and, and as Tommy says, sometimes when they're doing that, it could be that we're made aware that there's an option to appraise before a decision is taken. And then we can see, and, and if we want to input, we can input. It's just about kind of open transparency of it all at times. Believe it or not, I'm actually on Tommy's side here because if I was an outside body wanting to, to get support in the Friesen Gallery, the first place I would come would be the local councillors. Right? But it's there, it's there, so we are where we are here. Are we ready to move on to the recommendations, yeah? Right, okay, thanks. Um, okay, so... One were asked to note that Tennis Scotland and Sports Scotland have identified the Friesen Galloway as one of six priority areas for investment through transforming Scottish Indoor Tennis Fund. Uh, an independent options appraisal has identified King George V Leisure Complex as the preferred location for a regional indoor tennis centre. And 2.2 agree the development of a regional indoor tennis centre at King George V Leisure Complex at no capital cost to the Council, subject to receipt of external funding and attend the proper tender processes. So, uh, paragraphs 316 to 317. Agreed? Thank you. Right, we'll move on. Thanks very much, uh, Lee, Richard. Um, item 14, Coast to Coast Closed Road Rally on the 25th of July 2020. Uh, report is to consider an application from the Marcus Car Club Limited to hold a closed road car rally on roads in the west region on the 25th of July. I've got Graeme here to uh, take any questions along, obviously, with Head of Service. So, um, are we any need to add to this, Graeme, or any update? Yeah, just the update, the 3.4. <coughs> um, the permit for the event has now been issued by Motorsport UK, and the application for the motorsport <coughs> order was received at the end of last week. Thanks very much. So, we, John? Hey, thank you, Chair. I very much welcome the economic uplift this event will give to the west of the region in particular. However, could you fully explain what impact it will have on the various different classes of roads? Will, for instance, the A75 or A77 be closed at any time to normal traffic? 
Yeah, unfortunately, I think the way the papers have come out, the route's perhaps not totally clear. But basically, the the idea is that the starting point will be in Sunra, but it'll be under normal road conditions until they get up towards the Cairn Ryan area, and then that is a section of road from there round towards um, New Luce that will be closed. So there's only there are three individual sections of road, but they use other bits of the road obviously to travel in between these. It will have no impact on those what's other than additional traffic. Is that? Okay, uh, thanks, Dave Doogie. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> Just to ask a question in terms of the development of the, the, the order, what consideration has been given to the environmental impact of the, the rally? Um, has this been looked at, and will there be any uh, references to that in the, the order when it's published? We will have a look at, into that, yes, as part of the process. Yeah. Nothing as yet. Okay, thanks. So just for clarity, so that's things like the grass verges and stuff like that. Um, is, is that kind of what you're meaning, Dougie? I, I'm not meaning that all the vehicles should be electric in the rally, although that would be quite interesting. Um, but yeah, just the, the sort of things that, uh, that, that kind of go amiss in terms of the impact on, on verges. Um, uh, there's also issues around noise and inconvenience to uh, local landowners and communities. I can clarify further than yes, we've already been in discussion with those and, and we're obviously in discussion with the legal services regarding that and <clears throat> at the moment the, the proposal is to potentially look at some sort of bond to make sure that if there is any damage then we have got a means of recouping it. Um, but the organisers assure us there will be very limited damage but we will be looking into that further during the whole process. Have to we'll just come back, come, in, we'll come back to you. It's just to say it's really important, you know, that everything that we uh, we involved in, in developing is looked at through the the, the, the lens of climate change, um, and uh, I'm sure there will be additional things that may be identified, and I'd be happy to assist if I can. Thanks, um, uh, Ian Howie first. I just want, is there any financial implications to the Council? Because my understanding is members in the west of the region received an email from the organisers with a suggestion that they may be coming, looking for some funding from the Council for this uh, activity. Um, from the road service side of things, then there is nothing, there is a cost to the organisers for promoting the order and the road closures, etc. Other than that, I, I, heard that they were making an application for some funding from somewhere, but I, I can't clarify that at this time. That's a separate thing, Ian. Um, I'll come to a separate place. Um, uh, uh, Ian Blake. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. <coughs> They're probably not the same likelihood in this particular rally. Uh, if we look back at the Tour of Britain cycle race, certainly when it came through Stuart Street, it left us with what you can only describe as graffiti on the road where they were encouraging participants, uh, right, virtually every village that the, the route went, they, that is quite clearly still evident on the roads. So it's just some way of ensuring that for, for this event, but all future events, that we put, lay something down uh, about uh, the amount of, gra of graffiti on the road surface. Yeah, I would expect that we'll get some sort of agreement in place that there's a full clean-up of the route when it's complete, before the road's reopened as well. So come back. The graffiti I'm talking about was spray paint. It would need to be resurfaced, I think. That, uh, but it's, it, it was the teams supporting the, the participants in the race uh, that were doing this to encourage them. We can raise that through the, the discussions, the ongoing discussions we'll have with them and hopefully they will have their stewards out there and they can monitor these things and hopefully we shouldn't encounter it this time. Okay. Um, uh, David? Uh, thank you, Chair. The uh, champion somewhat stole my thunder because uh, I was going to say that as, as, as a, a woke council that um, we should insist that there is at least an e-car category. And um, I don't know if there are any plans for an e-car category in that, but um, you know, it would be mighty nice. I could, I could imagine them going up to a wind farm and plugging it in and there's a pit stop. Uh, but uh, maybe it's a thing, actually. Um, we haven't gone into that with the organisers. Uh, I don't know whether they've got a section in that or not. I really don't know. The, we, we obviously, this is just the, the kicking off this order stage, and there will be further discussions with them. 
I can clarify with them in due course whether they will have some sort of electric vehicles involved. Um, just before I let you in, Andrew, I know F1 have got a new one category as well, so it is the future, I would suggest, but maybe no this year. Um, Andrew, you want in? Yep, yep. Oh. Could take part of the no other entrances. That would well, be a chance. Well. Um, I, 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 that would have to be a close councillors ca category, you know. Um, I, I, Andrew? Thanks, yeah, I completely support this. And I hope that I get to sell some fish suppers in Stranraam, and I hope that I can actually run with my hybrid car that I've got. Oh, absolutely, Andrew. Sorry? D David, you want Thank you, Chair. I'll get to this, Mike, eventually. Uh, yeah, I welcome this event as well. Uh, the projection is this could bring in somewhere around half a million pounds over the two days economic benefit to the Stranraer area. Uh, um, they're a very well organised team, the Makers Car Club. Uh, most of this event, or in fact, all the competitive parts of this event will take place on back roads. You know, so it's going to be probably well out of the way. They've done their public consultation as well. They've spoken to all the residents on the route. Yeah, um, I would like to see this supported by the council. I think their funding application went to the wind farms. Yeah, but it may well be in the future if this is a big enough event that they might come to Dumfries and Galloway Council looking for a, yeah, some sort of financial support similar to the Scottish Rally. Um, well, well, I, I couldn't agree more with you. So you finished, David? Yeah, because um, I, I see this as the West Coast Jim Clark Rally, right? Which brings in hundreds of thousands every year to the Scottish borders. So, um, an economic basis, I would say that. But I also think, you know, if you can put in the rear, if if it's successful and they want to do it again next year, that we have an E category, that'd be really interesting, wouldn't it? Right? Yeah. Um, so we come for. No more questions? Let's go to recommendations. Okay, so we're noting the application from the Makers Car Club and provide any comments regarding the proposal to run the event, which will uh, be noted by the officer, and the proposed route and timings for that event, that's the appendix, and agree to delegate the Head of Roads and Infrastructure Authority to issue an order under the Motorsport Order and Public Roads Scotland Regulations 2019, subject to the consultation and legislation requirements set out in paragraphs 3.3 to 3.8. Um, yeah, we're happy with that. Agreed. Thank you very much. Right, and now we're on to the really less um, controversial issues. Um, item 15, the use of Gaelic language on welcome to the Peace and Galloway road signs. Request has been received on the 14th of September 2019, which incidentally is my birthday, but uh, that's on the side, from the chairman of uh, Gaelic Dumgal for the Council to adopt a policy to include Gaelic language on the entry signs to Dumfries and Galloway. The request was that consideration be given to the provision of bilingual signs when the existing signs required to be replaced and that priority would be given to the routes into Galloway. Members are asked to consider the inclusion of Gal the Gaelic language on Welcome to Dumfries and Galloway road signs within the region. Again, Graham's here uh, with Stephen to take any, any questions. There was only one thing I just need to ask is that the the, the community council up at Kersfern wrote to me and I think they've written to some of the councillors um, saying that they would welcome it and they would they were they're wanting us to put um, signs as they come into Kersfern their their community council area um, recognising this. Um, no, no, I said yeah, yeah, but. Um, uh, I was asked if I put it forward, so I'm putting that forward, and this is all my introduction. We're still going to debate, right? So um, that's there. Um, one representation. The other thing, I'm just to make absolutely clear here, this was um, a response to a, a request from public organisation. So this isn't the administration position. So this is a non-partisan discussion we're going to have here. Um, so. Graham, I, I'm assuming you've got nothing to add to this. Okay, so let the fun begin. Right, uh, Ian. Thank you. Nothing terribly controversial in, in mine. The, I see 25% tw of the signs are on, uh, are on trunk roads. Are we as a council responsible for replacing these signs, or is that the responsibility of Transair? And if it is, I would have thought they could have done that on their own anyway. 
Uh, unfortunately, the council is responsible for replacing these signs because they are specifically for the, the region, um, and we need permission from them. But when it comes to replacement, um, they are our responsibility. They will maintain them. Definition of maintains probably going to wash every now and again. I'm waiting for a response in the question I asked in that one. But um, yeah, we are responsible for replacing these things. Probably. Thanks for that. And it's could we just have confirmation that there won't be any graphic design for all the new lettering if it's a cost neutral project? No, that's, uh, I mean, that is a proposal that's sitting there. There are variations to that they can come up with, but that won't cost any extra for variations to it, no. Okay, thank you. So I know to be too awkward, Chairman, I don't have an issue with it other than, I don't know what percentage of Scots folk speak Gaelic, and I don't know what percentage of the global population speak Gaelic. We do want to introduce folk into this region. Oh. So therefore, I think any sign that's constructed or, or, or erected should have done Friesen, Galloway and English first, and Gaelic underneath that, so that you're promoting the language, but you still make sure that folk understand the road signs and where they're actually visiting. Yeah, I think that's uh, pretty reasonable. Just as yeah, um, the design of signs is covered by the traffic signs regulations and general directions, and it quite clearly stipulates the order in which the Gaelic language requires to be on these signs, and it is the top. So, so if, if, if we wanted to go for something different, we would have to go for non-prescribed signage, which would need to go to Scottish Government for approval. And, and that, that would then incur cost. So, it, 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 this, just so we're absolutely clear, so the size of the writing on a sign, is that prescribed or um, can it be smaller yeah. at the top and bigger at the bottom? It can be. You can vary the, si the, vary the size of the text, you can vary the font of the text. Um, there are all sorts of areas. Tra when the traffic signs regulations were redrafted in 2016, it gave greater variety of what you can use on these particular signs. So, it can be different, yes, different sizes. Um, the colours are stipulated, um, but the order, as they say, is garlic and top, English below. Just a minute, it is garlic, not um, Andrew, and then David, yeah. Thank you, sir. I had a very similar question to Jim there, in the case of how many people actually speak garlic in this area, which is virtually nil. So why are we putting ga uh, garlic above our English speaking, where most folk are going to be reading that, just to confuse them? Um, I don't like the idea of us having to go for a lot of time and bureaucracy just to, if we were to agree on putting get garlic on the bottom underneath the English. I, I, I don't like the idea of having to go for all that and going for prescribed signage. And I, from what I'm getting from my constituents is they don't want this. They want us as councillors to be focusing on council issues. They want us as, can, well, they want council officers to be focusing on the roads, the potholes, etc. They don't want garlic signs. So I'm going to move that way. Don't go through with this. Let me add to that. I think that's a statement rather than a question. Um, David? I could re repeat, bagus ak swas, as we say in Old British. And that, of course, comes from Britonic, which is the uh, language which predates Gaelic in our region and has the stronger claim to be our second language. Um, however, I won't be calling for a Britonic to go on the, the signs because if you've ever driven in countries where they have more than one language on the signs, it's totally confusing. And you pass a sign staring at it, you know, in danger of crashing into somebody, and you've no clue what you've seen. You, you have to backtrack and read it again, maybe. And it's completely a, a ludicrous idea. Um, I've just checked the Gaelic name for Cars Fairn, and it is in fact Cars Fairn, um, as are most of the, uh, the Glen Ken's uh, region, which would be quoted as the, the, the best region to look at. Cars Fad is Cars Fada, Paul Maddy is Paul Maddy, uh, Del Shangan is Del Shangan. Um, what's the point? It's a different spelling, and it, it, they've only made up these spellings, like they did with police, to put on the cars. Uh, 
the, this is purely an SNP plan B. I mean, let's, let's be honest, everybody in this room knows that, that if independence cannot be achieved... No, 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 two seconds. It, uh, two seconds. The Gally, um, strategy in the recent Galloway was the result of an act that was passed before 2007. Well, which, the SNP which, predate which that, don't they? At that time, a Labour Lib Dem coalition. Okay, so this I, is not an SNP plot. It, I mean, well, in my opinion, it is. It is. And Sorry, uh, just making that point clear. A lot of the undernamed are nationalist by nature, and there's some some weak unionists here. But I, I was elected as a unionist. No one really knew me in the constituency I stood on. I stood against a great nationalist candidate, well known, and it got double the vote. So I know that people don't don't want this. People here are unionists, and they don't don't want to leave the UK. And I think it would be time for unionists in this room to stand up and say that whatever the Ouija's, the tribe uh, north of us, would decide in their hordes, we are going to stay with the United David, Kingdom. David, it's a point that you're... you're, you're this you're, is exactly oh, oh. on message. It's right. about... This is the drip, drip, salami tactic, uh, boiling of a frog. David, I'm asking must... you to stop. You've made your point. You're saying no. OK? I'm absolutely uh, saying no. I'm saying we've got you've made your yeah, point. In a I, number of languages. Um, and that's it. So just turn your mic off, thanks. Um, uh, anyone else want to speak? Uh, John. Just uh, as I say, when the Fair Trade, I think the Fair Trade Association, the, well, Fair Trade, when they got the, the region got the first trade, uh, Fair Trade in Scotland, they inquired about getting it added to the signs coming into Dumfries, Dum, the Dumfries and Galloway, actually, and they were told it would clutter the sign. How does the house this got to be different for cluttering the sign? And anyway, could we make sure? as in Galwegian Gaelic, because I don't know the difference between that and the other Gaelic, but Galwegian Gaelic, it uh, became an extinct language in 1760 when the last person that uh, spoke it died. So, as I say, could we make sure it's in, because we've got a lot of reference to Galloway here, could we make sure that it's in Galwegian Gaelic? <coughs> Galwegian, sorry, but I must admit I'd never heard Galwegian. of it. The request Galwegian. comes Not from Galwegian. Galwegian, Galwegian yeah. <laughs> That's the Karak request Galloway. has come for the Gaelic language, and uh, the actual translation was checked with the chairman who made ah, that, the request. Yeah. Um, so uh, that dialect. was the proposal that was put forward. Uh, in terms of the fair trade signing, we have said we're, we're considering requests separately for the fair trade zone, and the discussions with regard to that are ongoing. Um, the clutter issue is something that we we are in discussion about. Um, the, uh, but you all are can say in terms of clutter, these signs would meet requirements of the traffic signs regulations. So just Sorry, well, I should add, which would allow us to put some sort of logo in as well if we want to, so wanted. I just say, I mean, I was in agreement with what Jim said. Dumfries and Gallic should certainly be above the Gallic, but if that's another. Okay, I've got two speakers left. Um, I'll, no, no, I've no hardly. Um, okay, I'm going. I'm going first term speakers first. Okay, so uh, David, you come in first, and then Pauline, and then I'll come back to second time uh, speakers or third time speakers. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, it, it really has nothing to do with politics. This it goes back to the early 70s, uh, when the president was set. I don't see any harm in it uh, if it's cost neutral. It's a cultural and heritage thing, and I think it's something that, well, I would certainly like to see supported by the council. Yeah, um, definitely, as long as there's no cost involved. Okay, I'm going David and then Doogie, and then I'm going to aim, and then Sean. Well, thank you. Um, I'm going on the technical point, I'm, uh, we're asked to consider the request. Is it possible to have a vote today? And um, the, the one point, just to uh, talk about the signage, um, it's all very well if you have one town and then a similar spelling of the same town underneath it. You can, you can pass that and not have an accident. But if you've driven in countries where they have two or even three languages on their signs and there are multiple points of destination on that sign. Believe me, you just you just don't know what you're looking at. And it, it would defeat the purpose of having a sign. Okay, that's noted. Um, I've got uh, Doogie had said, then Sean, then Ian Howie. Not at this stage. But, but, 
we, we can have a vote, yes, but then uh, can we let the debate finish first? There's still people who haven't spoken. Chair, I think, I think uh, Councillor Drysdale was mentioned in the, the list of people who wanted to contribute, so I'm happy for her to have uh, her say first. Thanks, Dougie. Thanks, Chair. Just a quick one. I think we need to be clear here. It's just the welcoming signs, so it's not going to be as complicated as it is up north when you see people being foreigners in particular, because bless them, they haven't a clue where they're going when you get to roundabouts. At what the point I'd like to make is in Appendix 3, where there is a layout, a proposed layout and design of said signs, if the Gaelic comes first, it's really important that we as a council consider that font size to be a little bit smaller, because you do come at higher speeds into areas, and we need to make sure people are aware as to where they are. So if there's some ability and capacity for us as a council to have a bit of control over that, I think the local communities would be grateful that it was a little bit clearer, because I think that sign as it stands is a bit lacking in visibility. That's all. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Pauline. Um, sorry, so we're back to Dougie, Sean, and then Ian Howie. Yeah. Thank, thank it, it, If you would just say... Oh. Sean... Dougie, first. No, no, Dougie, you're not a first-time speaker. Sean is the one, yeah. He is a first-time speaker. Have you not spoken yet? No. All right, sorry. Right, come on in. Right. In you go. Uh, thank, thanks, Chair. Uh, I, I don't have any particular strong feelings when it comes to, to, to Gaelic, but, you know, having moved to uh, Dumfries and Galloway 10 years ago, um, it's been quite enlightening for me to see that there is a real local and cultural heritage in terms of uh, Gaelic having been spoken in this this, this part of the, the world. And, uh, you know, as far as Councillor James's comments, I would ask, what, why is it that you would want to try and suppress this this culture and and heritage, and the, the the you know the rabid nationalist nasty nationalist SNP agenda is just absolute nonsense. Uh, I would support what Council Councillor Ingalls and Councillor Drysdale have said on the matter, and just a couple of points in relation to Galloway. A year or so ago, there was a conference on. Uh, Gaelic uh, being spoken in this part of the world uh, at the Cat Strand in New Galloway. Uh, and the Galloway Glens Partnership are currently working on a, a project along with the University of Glasgow to identify historic place names in, in this part of the, in, in Galloway, uh, particularly around the Gaelic historic heritage. And as far as the, the community council are concerned, I, I also saw that email. Uh, which came from the, the Secretary of the Community Council. Um, and I was really, really pleased that they, they, the community councillors and members of the public were very supportive and thought this was an excellent idea. This is not about uh, politics. This is about people wanting to celebrate their local and cultural heritage. And I would ask, what's the harm in that? OK. Um, Sean, I think I'm... Yeah, it was really just along the same lines. I'm a little bit disappointed. Um, another of David's diatribes when he's, you know, he's full of uh, political conspiracies. I, I think it's, you know, I've got enough intelligence to look at this as, as what the request is, and that's really um, for, for actually some of these signs we put there. Maybe it would help promote tourism. It's not got a cost us anything. Um, it's not political. You know, everyone in Scotland owns St Andrew's Cross. Everyone should be proud of the, the Gaelic language. So I don't see it as political, and to make it something it isn't is, is frankly, ri uh, li ridiculous. Thanks. Um, Ian, I'm going to bring this to a close because we could go on forever with this in the soups here, and I don't want to get in called. Um, uh, Ian, it's... Uh, uh, thanks, Chair. It's just very briefly, has there been any road safety assessments done on this type of signage about the country and the past? Even if you're driving at 60 miles an hour, Taking your eye off the road for a second, you travel 88 feet. And I just have any assessments done. Do uh, the policing have any concerns about this, or is the road safety officer uh, no objections to this proposal being supported? The design of the signs is closely covered by the traffic signs regulations and general directions, so we are not stepping out with that. That is the, the, the guidance that we need to work to. So, unless we're going for something completely different, then Happy that it's, uh, that it's covered by those regulations. 
Um, in terms of um, Police Scotland, Police Scotland have actually, I have spoken with them and they, they, as long as it complies with the TSRGD, they're content. Sorry, I'm going to move to the recommendations then. I want to propose a motion, please. Um, but first of all, I'd like to say that anybody who thinks that the nationalists are not working daily towards uh, an independent Scotland is, uh, is totally wrong. Uh, that's just, it's just, they'd be nuts if you think it's any other case. Um, if there was any truth in, in the, this idea that this was to do with getting Gaelic names back, then people would be asking for respelling. Because many, many of our signs have place names which come from Gaelic. If you're not happy with the spelling, let's discuss changing the spelling. Um, so therefore, I think today we need to reject the idea of double naming on our road signs. That's my motion. You got a second, I, I, I hope so, by unions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I'd go to say that we go with the, the recommendation. I'm assuming that um, a, 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 an image of the, the sign uh, will come back to the committee for, for a, approval. So uh, if it's an amendment, I uh, say that we go with the recommendation as stated. Is that in there? Yeah. Thanks, David. You're, you're setting in, yeah? yeah? Just say the members could be clear on what type of sign is there supporting and then there'd be no need for it to come back. Um, it will still have to come back because these are only suggestions from the people who've asked us to consider it, am I right? Yeah, we can come back with a couple of options of various designs if that's what's desired. I think we've already had one point made that we need to reduce the size of the font of the garlic wording slightly. Um, so we can come back with two or three options if that's what members desire. So that would be built into the recommendation um, um, yeah, yeah. So that would be incorporated into your amendment, Dougie, that uh, it would come back to um, for final approval by this committee. Um, what did what you say there? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Just a second. I'm seeking government advice here. Yeah. Okay. So to be clear on on the decision you're making, then are you agreeing in principle to the inclusion of Gallic language on the road? signs subject to the consideration of the designs coming back to the committee? Yeah, yeah and approval of the, the committee. Yeah. Thanks, Claire. OK. Uh, over to you, Claire. OK. I, I, as I've just said, the com the, the, um, there's no seconder. For uh, 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 Andrew, do you see? Oh, sorry. Okay, I've got a vote then. <laughs> right, okay, the motion is uh, to reject the double naming on the road signs. The amendment is to agree in principle to the inclusion of Gallic language on the road signs that report to come back to committee with the various options on what the design could look like. So, going to the vote, Chair. Amendment. Vice Chair. Motion. Councillor Blake. Amendment. Councillor Campbell. Amendment. Councillor Davidson. Amendment. Councillor Dempster. Amendment. Councillor Drysdale. Amendment. Councillor Justy. Motion. Councillor Howey. Amendment. Councillor Ingalls. Councillor James. Motion. Councillor Little. Amendment. Councillor Marshall. Amendment. Councillor Ronnie's left. Councillor Scobie left. And Councillor Tate. Motion. And Councillor Young. Amendment. Eleven. 11 votes to 4, amendment carried. Thank you. Um, we'll move on now to item number 16. Uh, the development of a cultural strategy 
for the Police in Galloway an update. The report presents uh, members with an update on the progress regarding the strategy and summarises the findings of a stakeholder engagement programme that took place between June and September 2019 and informed the draft strategy. I've got uh, Harry uh, again and uh, Rebecca Coggins is here to take any questions. Is there any update, Harry, or are we quite content to go to questions? Quite, quite happy to go to questions, members. Just certainly, uh, this is just a brief summary. Uh, the intention is that the uh, seminar that's detailed in the report will go into a lot more uh, depth in advance of the draft strategy coming back to this committee in June. Okay. Um, hey, Pauline, yeah? Apologies, I just wanted to quickly speak, if that's okay, Chair, before I have to head um, to another event. I'm so sorry. Um, thank you, Harry. Just a number of points that we've been speaking to a number of communities about that I would love to get a bit involved if we've got time to meet um, privately, because I really firmly believe, listening to constituents, that the cultural strategy ought to consider and encompass all sorts of ideas to put us back on the map um, along the following lines. So literary tourism, our unique biosphere status, which is often, as we all know, forgotten in Dumfries and Galloway, um, the dark, dark Sky Park, um, the Neolithic rock art, which is found on many of our walk, walks, um, the vast opportunities with all the sports, hiking and walking, the pilgrimage route has been mentioned by a number of constituents, which is a really positive thing to think about, and lastly, the first carbon new possibility of, and Councillor Campbell's just going to love this, and quite rightly so, um, a constituent's idea, not mine, possibly looking at the first carbon neutral holiday destination with an app to op offset the journey. There you go. So it's just ideas that I wanted to present today as a matter of talking point, because I'm going to have to excuse myself, but thank you for the time on that. I appreciate where you're heading for. So, uh, yeah, I, I think most of what you described there, though, is um, more about the tourism strategy, but I, I totally get the need for the two cultures to talk to each other, yes, so that they can work together, so I'm pretty sure we can give you that, that assurance, is that fair enough? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No problem. Anyone else? Right. Well, well, that, I, you, I, I hope we will, um, uh, you know, take account of our Britonic heritage when we think about our culture in the future. Oh, well, absolutely, and uh, it depends where the, uh, that mystical line is between what was Celt and what was uh, uh, Welsh, but you're absolutely right. Um, so I, I, I do know my history in that one, but uh, um, just to show off a wee bit. So are we comfortable to go um, to note the progress, note the wide participation, consider and comment on the key findings? We've not really done that, but uh, other than that very worthwhile piece of information, and then agree to the members' seminar when we can talk about it in more detail. Comfortable with that? Thank you very much. Um, uh, thanks very much, Rebecca. Uh, Okay, no, item 17 is the surplus property in the Priest and Galloway. Um, the purpose of the report is to ask members to agree that the 10 areas detailed in the report are surplus to the requirements um, of the community's directorate. Um, I, 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 Andrew Maxwell is here and James, James and uh, uh, Graham to answer any questions. Is there any update on this? Are we happy just to go to questions, uh, uh, Andrew? I think it's your baby, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, are we any questions? Hmm? Um, all right. Um, sorry, yes, there, there is a typo um, at, at item number seven. It's actually 66 Glen Charlotte Road, though, BT. Right, okay. So, we had spotted it, Ian. Um, but uh, um, thanks. So, are we ready to go straight to questions, Ian? Yep, that, <coughs> I was going to raise that point. The other one is, <coughs> sorry, the, have these proposals been to the relevant area committees for their consideration? No, they've not been to com area committee. The first thing is for the client department to declare its surplus to requirements before it's taken to area committee or whether it's taken to the common good committee. Okay, so it's a, it's a procedural paper, Ian comes here first, yeah. So are we happy with that, and then we can look at them in detail in our area committees or whatever. David, you want in? Are you about to close the item, or can, could I like to comment on one of the sites? 
or no, 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 get close it. No, I mean, have you a comment about one of the sites, or you want to ask a question rather than a comment? Question? Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, and um, well, in fact, let's let's have two questions. I, um, previously, I've um, asked. Perhaps the officers need to um, think about how they advertise items when they're for sale. I don't know if these items are going to be put out for open sale, but. Um, I think it's worthwhile paying the extra to go on Zoopla and Right Move, in addition to being on the council website. Um, but my question uh, regarding number six is, um, when we're disposing of an asset such as this, is there an option to uh, try to dispose it in the form of, a, well, not dispose it, but actually lease it out or open, make ourselves open to offers to lease? Because um, in this particular case, it's a, a large area strategically placed in the middle of a town, and once it's gone, it's gone, whereas maybe we could uh, achieve uh, a yearly income and still, um, you know, revisit the usage of it in 10 or 20 years' time, which might be a better uh, option when it's in such a strategically important position. Okay, um, Andrew? Certainly, we can put something in the actual sale where we can have a clawback for that but normally when property is declared surplus to requirements you know it's our intention to get rid of it because we don't have a requirement for any more i.e maintenance responsibilities etc have we considered leasing um this lot ever no it's not something we considered but we can do that do, do I need anybody else to think that's a good idea, or I... uh, not really? Because again, uh, I think basically what we're saying is, uh, as a committee here, if we agree this, is it will then go through another process where it will be uh, discussed in greater detail in the local in the localities. So, um, I, I, in terms of being we're, 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 remember, remember, we're not we're not agreeing to the sale or whatever it might be. We're actually agreeing that, that we think this is surplus. Yeah. Yes, I think possibly it is surplus today, but I don't think it's maybe surplus tomorrow. So my preference would be to try to lease this, if possible, this particular piece of ground, rather than um, than sell it. I, I don't know when I introduce that in the in the stream, but if it passes as surplus and our normal route is to just then sell it, then I, my chance is now to say that I don't think it should be sold. As part of the disposal process, this is common good, so it'll need to go to the common good committee for final say, final approval. Well, well, that, that's right, because it, it, it's not it, it, the decision we're making is whether it goes on through a process here. Okay, um, Jim. I was only got to say, Chair, I understood there was a process, and that due process is we had to if we if we declared a property or an asset surplus, we had to dispose of it. There wasn't an option. I thought that was what we had to do. And if it's common good, I only hope they get the receipt for it. <laughs> yes, they'll get the receipt, yes. Absolutely. Um, anybody else? Okay, I'm going to move to recommendations. Um, to see me going through all nine, I'm just going to, are, are we happy to agree um, that the uh, recommendation is one to nine? Okay, thank you very much. Now, um, as I said earlier, there is an extra piece of business, um, and I'm just going to ha hand the stuff out. It's only um, really one side of A4 and, a, and a, a picture, which tells a thousand words. Okay. Um, so basically, what I'm, uh, I'll go through my preamble when it's getting handed out. And it's the report provides details of a culvert replacement and seeks members' approval for reallocation of monies within the carriageway drainage budget of the infrastructure asset class capital programme for 2019-20 to fund emergency works. The report is presented as an additional late report for member consideration due to recent rapid deterioration of the road. The report should not be delayed to, uh, to a later meeting due to need and to complete works before a complete collapse of the culvert. Um, I, I, James is here to answer any questions on it. Um, are you needing time to read this, or are you quite comfy? Just to, to go straight. I, I, um, I, so are we are we happy just to agree and let's, let's get the job done? Yep. God, I should never say things like that. Eh? Let's just get it done. Um, right, James, uh, uh, thanks very much. Uh, so recommendations, note the deterioration of the culvert of the CU1W at Glenluce. 
which has led to failure of the road pavement and 2.2 agreed the inclusion of the replacement works as a project within the infrastructure asset capital class capital program 2019-20 with an estimated cost of 70k contained within the carriageway drainage program. Happy to agree with that. Great, thank you. Thanks once again. Thanks very much for the way you've conducted the meeting, and uh, lunch is there. <laughs>